And okay. Hi, I'm Brian. That's Josh. Welcome to Pod Rocket. How's it going? Yeah, hi. It's going well. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for being here. Um, tell us about yourself. I do this with everybody. There's no way I can intro you better than you can intro yourself. So <laughs> by all means. I wouldn't be so sure about that. I'm terrible at introducing myself. But okay. my name is Josh. <laughs> I'm a software developer. Uh, I've worked for organizations like Khan Academy, DigitalOcean, Gatsby. Um, in the last year, year and a half, I've left that kind of uh, IC work to pursue starting my own business. So I've been creating educational content for developers, uh, like a CSS course that I just created. A CSS course, is your, uh, that is a bold move. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I, I never, uh, the thing that gets me in trouble when I tweet the most is when I talk about CSS. So it was, <laughs> it's definitely a bit of a fraught thing. But I really wanted to teach CSS because I noticed, and so my CSS course is called CSS for JavaScript Developers, a very kind of boring title, but I think it summarizes it well, because I do think that there are so many JavaScript developers who are front-end developers, or people who work with frameworks like React or Vue or Angular, who never really uh, like took the time to really learn CSS. We all kind of pick it up as we go. We get it maybe, you know, like uh, if you go to a boot camp, you do like two days of HTML, CSS, and then you're just expected to slowly build on that throughout your career. But CSS is a difficult language to do that with because there's all kinds of like implicit secret mechanisms just doing their work under the hood. You write three characters or more than that, three statements, display flex, and all this stuff happens. <laughs> like it changes how the layout is totally being calculated. And there's all these little mechanisms behind the scenes. Uh, and as someone who was a JavaScript developer who didn't really feel that comfortable with CSS, it uh, really changed my entire like front end workflow after I took the time to really figure out what the heck was going on down there. Um, so that's kind of my, uh, I had a few things I wanted to cover. You know, I have the most experience teaching React because I've taught at a bootcamp and I created the React curriculum for that bootcamp. Mm. Uh, but there's already so many good React resources out there. I didn't really feel like there was very much for CSS that was specifically targeted uh, for people who were primarily JavaScript developers. So, yeah. I feel like if we like, it's a much longer conversation if we talk about like why it's hard <laughs> or or confusing or um, I don't know maybe debating the very nature of CSS like that is one thing. But what are the we could talk about it. But I think what what I'm interested in now is like what is it that when you were what were you working on or kind of what were you thinking about was like okay I I need to get out there and actually teach CSS because this is a problem? Yeah, oh, it's a good question. I don't know that there was any single thing. Um, you know, when I would teach at the bootcamp, I would notice that you get to the final weeks of the bootcamp and people, you know, students will work on their final projects. And as much as people tripped over JavaScript, I noticed people developing those muscles of like, okay, you get an error message, you Google the error message, you learn a little bit more about what JavaScript is like. And then the next time you hit this problem, you remember some of that. With CSS, it, people kind of plateau really early. And I think it's because, and this kind of, uh, I'll give you like the Cliff Notes version of why I think CSS is hard to learn. Uh, there's no error messages. There's no console, right? If things don't do what you expect, there's no information about why they don't do what you expect. And so much of it is implicit. Like with JavaScript, there is like a certain amount of it that is implicit, but mostly you write the code, the code executes, you get an output, right? The CSS, uh, we often focus on these properties. Like you learn what position absolute does or what Z-index 4 does. But those two properties are just inputs to a layout algorithm that most developers don't really understand. <laughs> so you learn, like, this is how this, fun this property, uh, this is how this property can tweak things in this algorithm. But they're just inputs to a function, right? CSS will use that data to calculate the layout. But often we don't really take the time to learn what that layout calculation is all about. I guess I guess what I'm curious about then is like how do you think about CSS um, versus JavaScript, right? Like how are you thinking about um, how best to use it, how best to learn it? Maybe use it is not really that useful, which is funny to say. Uh, how, how do you, like how do you think about learning it? Are there different ways to go about it, um, or is it just like anything else? Yeah. So the the biggest thing that I did in my own work that really helped was you know, you're like you're going along, you're chugging along, everything's good, and then you throw a couple CSS declarations in, and they're the same. You know, you have maybe like this go-to pattern that you've used over and over again. You throw it in, 
and it doesn't do what you expect, right? You'd use position absolute top zero, left zero, and the box isn't in the top left corner of the screen where you expect it to be. Or you put Z index five, and it's still somehow below something that has Z index three, right? I used to get into these situations and uh, try to get myself out of them as quickly as I could. <laughs> so you Google, like tr you try to be as close as you can with your Google search. You just copy paste things on Stack Overflow. And the moment it does what you expect and you're, or maybe you just give up and say, okay, well, I can change the layout to meet this new constraint that I don't know how to solve. Um, you move on with your life. What I started doing was like settling into this uncomfortable situation as if it was like a nice warm bath. <laughs> like you just kind of say, okay, I'm going to stick with this problem until I understand what is going on here. And often that would start by me just experimentally trying things. Like, what if I change this value? What if I, you know, you delete the value and then you just press the arrow key to go through the different possibilities that CSS, the dev tools will suggest for you. So like, what other values can I put into this property? Um, sometimes that takes the form of going to the MDN documentation and trying to see like, what does MDN, the source of all truth, know about this given property and what pieces of that am I missing? Sometimes, like more recently, the last couple of years, I started just going to the specification, which for a long time I was intimidated by because you figure, you know, the specification is like not really meant to be read by people like me. It's meant to be used by the browser integrators who need to actually build out their implementation. Uh, but what I've discovered is that the specification is actually great. Um, especially like the Flexbox specification is the one that I've spent the most time in. And you learn so much about how the language at least is supposed to work. Uh, there's always that risk that browsers will have not implemented it exactly to spec. I've been bitten by that. The perspective property bit me with that recently. Um, but in general, like the CSS specification is like this golden source of information. And you can, like, I just had that experience going through it of like, oh, that's why this weird behavior actually isn't weird. Um, I have an example, which we'll see if I can describe this because it's, you know, it's hard to talk about sure. something so visual. Yeah. Um, let's say that you put overflow auto on something. Um, or let's say that you put overflow Y auto on something. So what you want is that if the thing goes below the bounds of this rectangle, you get a vertical scroll, right? You can scroll up and down. But then you notice if I push something outside the horizontal bounds, right? So I have something that I push off to the left, all of a sudden I can scroll in both directions. And I never set overflow X to auto. I can put overflow X to visible, which is supposed to be the default value. And yet I still have the, like, I can still scroll over to the side. Um, and the reason for this is that like, you can read the specification to learn how scroll containers work, which is what is created when you use the overflow property. And what you learn is that what you've essentially done is created a box that things can't leave this box, right? You have now created this condition where anything that leaves this box will be clipped by it. Um, and then when you start to think about it, like how would it work if it didn't work that way? Like what if something overflowed into the bottom right corner, overflowing in both directions? Like would I expect it to be visible horizontally, but scrolled vertically? Like it doesn't really make sense. Um, another little thing that I learned, the difference between overflow auto and overflow hidden, they both create a scroll container, but overflow hidden removes the scroll bars. <laughs> so either way you're doing the same thing. It's just overflow hidden has no scroll bars. Um, which is this fun little detail that you would only ever learn reading the specification, but that like, you know, it's just an example of like, the kinds of, you have these discrete ideas in your head and they all start to snap together and the entire puzzle, you can start to see the koala in the puzzle kind of thing. I think that's a, uh, I think that's a great point. Like, I, and I wonder, like, even just that one, that one little pearl of wisdom, you know, like that you, you only learn that and you didn't go looking for that. That's not something that you were, you just kind of like, I, cause if you had, of course, if you were looking for that, you'd never be able to find it easily. Um, yeah, I do all, I, I see that a lot or have seen that a lot with CSS. Like it's hard. Like, I wonder, is there, um, like, what is the end goal? Like, what should the average, in your opinion, what should the average kind of dev, like, what should they aim for when it comes to CSS knowledge? You know? It, yeah. Yeah. I would say that there is absolutely like, you know, and I, I, I feel like sometimes I get a little carried away and I make it sound like CSS is completely intuitive and completely knowable. It's tricky, right? Like the, CSS is definitely a tricky language. And that I think comes down to two things. It comes down to the fact that, like, and this is kind of with JavaScript too, we, we really value backwards compatibility. So rather than like, if we were to design CSS today, we would do things very differently. We're kind of hampered by the fact that we started with it in flow layout as this like document. Like we gave us, we gave developers the tool to build like word processor type things like documents. Um, and now we've kind of built on top of that in increments. 
Um, the other thing is just that we have, you know, so many different devices, like responsive design is such an inherently tricky problem. And every device is going to implement the specification slightly differently. So there's always going to be like, like, I don't know if it's realistic to feel so comfortable with CSS that you never stumble over it. But my goal and kind of where I feel like I've reached after a few years of really being intentional about this is to have a complete enough mental model that I never feel like my day is going to be waylaid by some really frustrating issue. Like, I feel like I have the tools that it's not always going to be smooth sailing. But when I do hit something that doesn't really make sense, uh, actually, I get kind of excited when that happens because it means that I can add like another piece to my mental model, right? My mental puzzle is starting to get a little bit clearer. Um, but I, I would say that it's been a very long time since I felt like my day was ruined by the like uh, inconsistent feeling of CSS getting in my way. So I think it is totally realistic to try and shoot to become in a place, not totally unlike when you get really comfortable with JavaScript, right? Where you're still going to get weird errors, but you never feel lost. Like you always feel like, okay, well, mind you, <laughs> there are still times with JavaScript I feel lost, especially when we start, uh, I dealt with some weird web webpack issue today that mm. that's just the whole thing. Um, <laughs> But you know, like in the same kind of, I've been using React since like 2015 now, and I feel pretty comfortable with it. Like it's it's rare that React throws me for a loop, and I think the same thing can definitely be true of CSS. I'm thinking and, and trying to think of I, it just I don't know what it is. Like there's something, it seems, and maybe it was actually goes back to being being kind of hampered by when CSS was created, right? Like that maybe makes sense to me. What it is about it that just seems to um, what's a diplomatic way to put it? Vex people. And then I'll, like, like there's people's days are, I mean, you said people's days are ruined by CSS and there are, uh, there, are, <laughs> there are hundreds of memes to, out there to kind of confirm that you don't necessarily see that with JavaScript or, I mean, believe me, you do see it, but not with not as much. I don't know. I mean, I, but so there's that. And I don't, I don't purport to be, uh, an expert in any way on whether one is better than in another, but um, yeah, I do think that there is a, a specific kind of person who gets really excited about pulling CSS apart. And what I mean by that is like, like you're already talking about it like it's a puzzle. You're already talking about it like this is. I'm going to read all of the documentation, figure out what is going on here um, to solve this problem. And I wonder, like, if that is a requirement for being considered an expert at CSS. And who cares if you're even considered an expert, just a practicing CSS expert? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I don't even really know if I consider myself an expert. I feel like what I consider myself is someone who has filled in enough of the puzzle that I feel I can be very productive as a front-end developer. And that's that's the goal, right? I think we, I want to get people to a place with my course where if you go through this course and you absorb the stuff inside, you'll be able to chug along with CSS just as well as you can with JavaScript and maybe even enjoy it if you don't currently enjoy it, which I think is true for a lot of JavaScript developers. Um, there's, you know, I think that it's, uh, there's, there is a lot to it. And I it goes back a little bit to what we were saying before, where there's all these concepts like scroll containers, uh, containing blocks, stacking context, right? There's all this stuff that you, I spent, I started writing CSS in 2007, 2008. So I spent like almost a decade using the language without ever understanding these really fundamental concepts. And I think that's that's true for most developers. You have to go out of your way for that not to be true just because CSS is so implicit, right? Like we learn, like CSS is such a magical language, right? And I mean magical in the same way that Rails is magical, right? You write a couple lines of code and all this stuff happens. <laughs> and that's great when you're on the happy path and everything is coming together and you know, you're know you going quickly, but then something happens and you're totally lost because you don't actually understand what's happening under the hood. Um, I think the goal is to have enough familiarity with what happens under the hood that when you do hit these strange situations, you have kind of a set of tools you can use to get your dig yourself out of the ditch kind of thing. I want to take a step back from CSS itself and talk a little bit more about your journey, um, kind of from individual contributor to instructor. Um, and I asked about kind of like the, what do you think the kind of person, uh, you know, what the traits are, what the qualities are, or whatever. Um, Cause there's a much smaller uh, group of instructors for CSS than JavaScript. So like, let's start at the beginning. Like, tell me a little bit more about kind of when you're like, all right, I'm going to do this thing. Did you go out and look at the landscape and see where you could fit and all of that stuff? Yeah. So there is a, a backstory that I don't mind sharing. Hopefully it's interesting. Um, 
I, in like March of 2020, right, right when everything was locking down, I injured myself, I hurt my nerve. And it meant that it started that I couldn't really type with my left arm. And then kind of curiously, it happened to my right arm too. And I spent a few months where I couldn't really type. Uh, and, you know, as a software developer, that's pretty frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> like you can't really do your job. Uh, and I did. So what I did is I learned how to dictate, right? I have this microphone sitting next to me, which I'm not using, even though I probably should be because I'm setting up a new computer. And it's not working yet. Um, but I had a microphone and I had an eye tracker. And these two things together would allow me to write code. Um, but it was slow. Like it's definitely slower. And it took a few months for me to get comfortable enough with that kind of routine, right? From not using my hands to write code, uh, that there was definitely a period in the middle there where I had this kind of realization that, my goodness, I don't have forever, right? Like, as a software developer, we all kind of have uh, a finite amount of characters that we will type in our lives. And hopefully for most of us, that's going to be like in the trillions, like it's going to be some very large number, um, but it's still a finite amount. And so I started thinking, like, what do I actually want to do, right? Like, I, I enjoy my job. I had a good job, but I, I liked this idea of following in the footsteps of people like Wes Boss and Ken C. Dodds and creating my own course. Uh, and so then the question became, what do I teach? Uh, and as I mentioned, I had uh, a good amount of experience teaching React. I had been teaching at a local bootcamp for a couple of years. Um, and it really was a matter of looking at myself and figuring out, okay, what... I like the idea of having a lot of impact, right? Uh, so I wasn't really... I mean, obviously, I did factor in what I thought would sell. But my main concern was, what can I do that will have like a tangible impact on the day-to-day -day lives of the developers uh, that go through this course, hopefully for a long time to come? And CSS like almost immediately stood out to me as like, oh, obviously that, uh, because you know, for the first, for first of all, like it's not going away anytime soon. Uh, JavaScript frameworks come and go, although it does seem like React has kind of settled in to be a, a pretty standard option. JavaScript itself, right? We have WebAssembly now. Um, who knows? We'll all be writing UIs in Rust in a few years. But CSS, there is no WebAssembly for CSS. And beyond that, beyond just it's like, uh, like there's no way to do layouts on the web without CSS. You can come up with some fancy abstraction that means that you're not writing CSS, but at the end of the day, the browser only understands CSS, right? Everything compiles and abstracts away. Um, it's also just the thing that, especially in my niche, right, in the like JavaScript Twitter community, uh, it's the thing that I saw, and you mentioned this too, like that's what people complain about, right? You see every every day you see someone uh, talking about how CSS is making their life harder. And having gone through a similar kind of transformation myself, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could kind of remove that pain from typical front end development and kind of make people, you know, especially because so many people are already comfortable with JavaScript and HTML, they're two thirds of the way there. <laughs> if I can fill in that missing piece, you'll have the whole set, right? You'll complete the Trinity and then life will be glorious. So that was kind of the thought process, at least. <laughs> I'd like it. Um, I'm the, I mean, you did touch upon it a, a little bit, is um, thinking about what would sell, or at the very least, like, what do people really want? And especially when the the trend um, is, is JavaScript heavy. Um, how did you do any kind of, like, was it just gut, or were you doing any research, or were you talking to folks? How did that work? Yeah, there was some informal. In yeah, I wouldn't sure. uh, research really makes it seem like I'm much more organized than I am. Um, you know, I have a blog and I started writing more CSS posts. And I noticed that my CSS posts, like my most popular C posts now are on CSS. I also noticed that like on Twitter, like here's something people may not realize. When you add someone to a list, if that list is public, the person you're adding gets a little notification. You know, you have added so-and-so to your list X and the list is named. And I noticed that people started adding me. It used to be I was always getting added to like JavaScript and React. And I started getting added to CSS lists, um, which kind of made me think that there is an app because I was still sharing JavaScript and React stuff, right? I was just mixing in a little bit more CSS stuff, but that's what seemed to be really uh, what people were really into. Um, so yeah, it was that definitely helped. Like that gave me the kind of confidence to say, maybe this is worth like burning through some of my life savings and spending a few months building something without any real kind of promise that anyone would buy it. Uh, it did help to see that, oh, actually there is like, at least for free content, there is demand for this. That's true. Do you feel like you'll run out? This is, and it's it's similar to the question in, that I asked earlier is like, what's the end goal? You know, if you are, if you're the developer and you should think, well, when, how much CSS is enough CSS for me to know? Do you feel like you'll ever, what the, the reverse problem, how much is enough to teach? How much is like, when do I when do I stop talking about CSS? Does that ever enter your mind? 
Yeah, I mean, when I first started, I figured I would spend three, four months on this CSS course and I would churn out like one or two courses a year. And CSS would just be one part of that. Like I'd have a React course. I, I want to do like an animations course. Uh, but A, I vastly underestimated how long it takes. It took me over a year of full-time work to create the course. Sure, yeah. Um, and B, um, I realized that there actually is like still more I could do in this world. There's And CSS keeps changing, right? Like we're getting a bunch of exciting stuff. Like container queries are right around the corner, which is going to like totally invalidate a whole module that I have, which is a good problem to have because it means I'll get to remove all the like, here's the like weird hacky things you have to do to solve this problem. And now here's this nice new way. Uh, you can do it instead. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I would like to do more than just CSS at some point, but I, I don't really worry about like uh, running out of stuff to do with CSS or with like CSS. Like I'm okay with that being my brand now. If that's if that's what uh, what people are looking for, then yeah. Yeah. No, and I didn't mean like like hey, when do you think you'll stop talking about CSS? Like I, what I meant was for like for me um, when when I was thinking about like strictly JavaScript content. Like at some point, I was like we will run out of thing. It'll be a very long time, but presumably unless, you know, frankly, unless uh, front end keeps kind of going the way it's going and becoming more and more complex, maybe we never will. But at some point they'll be like, okay, you know, you know how to, you know how to put a menu together, right? In whatever, oh, whatever. I think, so is. you're saying like, and I just, I, now I think I'm kind of cluing together what you were getting at. Yeah. Um, like how much does the average person need to know and what happens when you've taught that person everything they need to know? Is that kind of where you're going? Sort of. Like, is there, is there a thing where it's kind of like, and I don't, there's no way to really quantify it, which is why I'm asking is like, is there an intuitive way that's like, this is probably, it's probably enough. This is probably like, I think this is good. So you've got the Holy Trinity and then, then what, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I do think that the reason I like software development isn't because I like learning a, a, an ever increasing treadmill of additional ways to do things. I like building stuff, right? Like I, uh, one of the things that I, when people ask me, like, I get this question a lot, like, uh, I'm learning to code, what, what project should I build? And my answer is always like, do something that is personally interesting to you outside of coding. So one of the first things I did, I used to yo-yo semi-competitively. And I built like a tool that would like with a graph show me the distribution of weight, diameter, and width for a bunch of different yo-yos. And I used D3 and I had this fun little graph. Uh, that was fun, right? I also, I played Beat Saber, a VR video game. And so I built myself a Beat Saber level editor using 3JS. Um, if you can find like a way to connect this thing that you're learning to a separate interest or hobby that you have, it's so much more motivating. Um, so yeah, like I, I don't know that, uh, I mean, it is, you know, there, there always is new stuff to learn because things keep changing. Um, but I'm not really worried about like what running out of things to teach or like uh, trying to figure out exactly where the threshold is of like, how can I tell if this person knows enough? Like my goal really is just to give people enough tools so that they can do these kinds of things and build the sorts of things that they want to build. Um, if that makes sense. No, totally. Um, speaking of building things, do you feel pressure to, to, uh, execute perfectly, given that you teach CSS and like everything should be, no matter what, no matter what device, like everything should be wonderful. Do you, do you feel that? <laughs> <laughs> it is funny because, you know, I have, uh, I get more, I get a lot of bug reports of very obvious CSS mistakes for the like CSS landing page that I'm selling my CSS course on. <laughs> it's always funny when someone's like, hey, you made this really obvious basic mistake on the page that you're trying to use to show people why they should trust you to teach CSS. Um, and, you know, I, I think that they're, all of us will make mistakes, right? That's like inevitable. Um, and what I have heard from some people, like often someone will come in, we use Discord as our community chat, and they'll say like, hey, uh, I saw you posted a solution video for this exercise. I found this other way to solve it, which I think might be a little bit easier. And I'll look and I'll be like, oh, you're right. That is a better solution. And I think people are always like happy to see when I didn't immediately have the most optimized solution because it kind of shows them that like, you know, we're all just learning. And uh, like, I think it gives people more permission to forgive themselves for the mistakes that they make. That's a really good point. I think um, it's one of the things that, that I frankly really like about the people who read the log rocket blog, for example, like when an author makes a mistake, like 
the vast majority of comments is like, Hey, you made a mistake here. You know, like we can, there's not, no one gets that upset or they have questions like, did, did I, did, did I mess up? I always tell the story. Uh, I don't think I've told it on the podcast before, but, um, when I first started at log rocket, um, and I was at a trade show and, um, somebody asked me, you know, like, how does log rocket the product work? And I said, Oh, it instruments the Dom. And the person asked me, well, what do you do about the mouse? And I was like, well, it's, that's part of the Dom. And they were like, you sure? I go, oh, I'm, I'm super sure that that's yes. I just doubled down on it. And they're like, Oh, okay. So both of us walked away, you know, I'm clearly wrong, but this person wasn't like, you're <laughs> definitely wrong about that. They were just like, <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. Or they just were polite and didn't want to tell me that. But like, it was at the time I, I was, then I went back later and I was like, Oh, that was really nice of them. So anyway, that's a long <laughs> commentary on me being dumb and uh, or at the very least ignorant. And then also just kind of like, yes, it is um, this, you know, web devs in general seem to be pretty. It's nice to see other people, you know, who you think are perfect, not be perfect. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. It is, you know, like I did spend probably three or four years uh, like I, I didn't. I think I mentioned I alluded to this. I had a moment where I realized that I was just really frustrated with CSS being the thing that kept derailing me. Like I felt particularly frustrated when CSS would get in my way because I just would have no idea where to start, right? Like it's, with JavaScript, there are breadcrumbs you can usually follow. With CSS, it's just like, my goodness, what do I do now? Um, and so we, we talked about this, like using MDN docs and specification and experimentation. It was a few years of doing that, not like full time, but just whenever I would hit a problem, I would spend a couple hours digging into it. Um, and so because I've gone through that, I do think that while I don't actually know if I consider myself an expert, like there are people like Jen Simmons who know way more about CSS than I do or ever will, right? But I know more than the average JavaScript developer because I've had this experience over the past few years and that I think is useful to them. I also think there's something to be said for uh, teaching someone something that you yourself have learned recently because you have more empathy with what it's like not to know that's not something. It's not like you've you you're so far ahead of where everyone else is that you have no recollection of what it was like not to know this thing. I'm struggling with this a little bit now because I kind of want to create a design course uh, and I'm not a designer. <laughs> <laughs> I design things like, you know, people can look at my blog. I designed that. Um, and so I think I, I'm capable of producing a decent design, but I've never trained under that. It's just that I have, you know, if you go to my GitHub, I have 250 repositories and the majority of those, right? Some of them are forks. Some of them are like CLI tools. Most of them are side projects that I wanted to build where I had to be the designer because I didn't have a designer on my team. Um, and so in the course of doing a couple hundred projects, I learned also like collaborating with designers. I do think like what I mentioned with CSS, it's been a few years of me slowly getting a little bit further and further. Um, but it is, it's, I'm trying to convince myself that that's okay because what business do I have teaching a design course when I've never worked as a designer? But I actually think, I would have, especially design for devs, right? Like I can put design in a dev context. I think it actually would be really helpful, but it is uh, it is hard to shake yourself from the idea that the people who teach the course must be like the top of the industry. Like right. there's no sense learning from someone that isn't at the absolute pinnacle of the thing that you're trying to learn. Um, I'm going to ask you a cliched question, but I don't care because it's I'm, I'm the host of the show today. Um, like, honestly, like, I, wh where do you find the time to do all of this stuff? <laughs> like, it, it's, <laughs> I feel like there's a lot going on between design, CSS, dev work, running your own business. It's definitely, uh, yeah, there's, there's not enough time. And I'm constantly in awe of how I can finish the day with a checklist that looks even more full than it was when I started. Um, I think that, you know, the nice thing is that I don't have a job now. Like, well, I don't have a typical full-time job. I'm self-employed. So I can spend all of my time on these sorts of things. When I did work as a dev, it was, uh, I look back now and it's uh, no surprise that I developed a repetitive stress injury because yeah, like I was putting in like way too much time because uh, I was doing a full-time job at Gatsby. I was teaching part-time at Concordia and I was publishing a new blog post every two weeks and working on my Beat Saber editor. It was a lot. Um, you know, I think that part of it is like, like the nice thing is there were, it was rare that I would say, I'm pushing everything else aside. And today I am focusing on learning CSS or learning design. It was always in the process of doing what I was already doing anyway. So it's like I'm working on some new feature. And rather than spend half an hour and kind of shoddily throwing together the CSS, I'm going to spend an hour and a half, two hours on it. So you like squeeze in a little bit of time, which is in service to the thing that you're building anyway. Like you'll produce a better result if you do that. Um, 
and it, design is the same thing. Like my favorite trick is when you're working with a designer, they send you the design, spend like 10 minutes talking to them about it and see if you can develop an intuition for why they made the decisions that they did. Like ask questions that are legitimately confusing to you. Like, why are we using this font size here and that font size over there? Why are we switching the color used on this element? Why did we choose twice as much space between the header and the H1 as we did between the H1 and the paragraph below? Um, those sorts of questions, first of all, designers are usually delighted to have these sorts of conversations, right? It's so rare for developers to take an interest in it. Um, but it also makes you a way better developer because now, right, they give you the design, they go home for the day, you're hacking on it, and you realize, oh, there's unspecified, right? Like I like to say, we're always making design decisions because uh, the process of implementation itself, like designs are like a, a very primitive sketch of what the final product is, and we have to fill in the gaps. So we have a mobile design, a tablet design, a, a laptop design. What happens in the spaces between those two designs or on really large screens? Or what happens when, unlike in the design where everyone has a name that is 10 to 15 characters long, we have a two character long name or a 35 character long name, right? Like there's all these sorts of inconsistencies, right? What happens when they view it on a browser that uses different native form inputs? Um, there's all kinds of things that like we are making the design decision. And if we can develop a bit of that intuition, where we understand the philosophy behind why this design is the way that it is, we can make educated guesses about those things. And we can make progress instead of like shooting them an email and then being blocked waiting to hear back or deciding that you'll work on something else and then you're context switching. Um, it's just nice. And you are like, you know, I'm not saying that we should all become like top level designers. I'm just saying that that intuition a little bit goes a long way because now you can make these educated guesses. You won't always get it right but you'll get it right more often than not. And that's enough to keep you moving forward. And first of all, like you'll be the design team's best friend. <laughs> like it's so useful for just cultivating these good working relationships. There's also like, and I, I try not to lean into this too much because I, I do think that it's, uh, it's making something that shouldn't be self-serving more self-serving, but developing that good relationship with design is good for so many reasons. Yeah. Like let's suppose that uh, design is asking you to do something that is surprisingly tricky. Let's say they want to have a paragraph that should truncate after three lines and show the ellipsis. This is actually easier now than it used to be. There's WebKit line clamp, but let's transport ourselves back in time where that was a really hard thing to do, right? You could do single line ellipsis. You could do overflow, text overflow ellipsis, overflow hidden. Um, but if you wanted multi-line ellipsis, you would have to get JavaScript involved and measure the pixel count and all of these things that were really difficult. And so uh, if you don't have a good working relationship with design and you tell them, oh, this actually is very difficult, you're likely to get some pushback and maybe like you will be forced to do this thing that is harder than it should be. Whereas if you have this good working relationship, you can start a dialogue and explain why this is more difficult than it seems. And they will trust you because you have proven yourself to be a good teammate and they'll work with you to find an easier alternative. Like you can make your own development life so much easier by having this good working relationship. Uh and it's a two way street, right? Like you can um, <clears throat> design becomes more aware of what's possible because you're they're having the same conversation as well. So like everyone's time is saved a little bit um, unless people feel like feel like kind of digging in. But usually it's like, let's how do we get to the best product possible with kind of the least amount of strife? Yeah. Another uh, another like to that same goal, I find it so useful when I worked at Khan Academy, I used to like fly on the wall. I used to be a fly on the wall in the design meetings. Um, and I don't know if this is how most design teams operate. I assume it is where like a designer will work on a first draft of something. It might be like not even have any color, right? It might just be like a sketch. Uh, and then they'll bring that to these design meetings and they'll discuss it as a group. I would just like pop myself in there. And then every once in a while, I would be able to say like, oh, actually this thing that you're talking about has X and Y technical constraint that makes it like much more difficult. Uh, and they can adapt that way earlier in the process than they spent another three weeks debating the pros and cons and doing a like a high fidelity mockup. And now they're attached to this idea and then you're telling them it can't be done. The earlier we can get in and kind of direct based on the technical constraints, uh, just the e easier it is for everybody and the more, uh, more we can get done, really. You are relentlessly positive. And this was a, uh, an awesome experience for me, really. I mean, I, I, I hope that I didn't give you the impression that I uh, view CSS negatively. I just, I'm, I'm looking, I'm always interested. Like I see, whenever I see the Peter Griffin meme with the thing, like I'm like, okay, like there's gotta be something under there that somebody has to figure out what's going on. So it was a real pleasure to have you on. Um, this is the part of the, of the show where I ask you if there's anything uh, you'd like to plug and then, you know, 
projects that maybe don't get enough attention or people or et cetera? Yeah. Well, first of all, just thank you for having me on. I'm always happy to come chat about CSS and this was absolutely a pleasure. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, the project I have the most enthusiasm for right now is Framer Motion. Uh, it's an animation library. And I built a library called React Flip Move that attempts to do what Framer Motion does, but does it nowhere near as well or as comprehensively. And I am just in awe at what you can do with it. Um, just to like, and again, hard to describe verbally something that is so in intrinsically visible or visual, but essentially it allows you to animate properties that aren't normally animatable. So let's say I have a container and I have it set as like display flex, flex direction row, and I want to flip it to flex direction column. So instead of being aligned horizontally, they should be aligned vertically. Frame or motion can animate that. So the things will actually like move around and adjust to their new position. You can animate any property and it does it in the most like hardware accelerated, optimized way possible. And it's just, it enables so many cool things. Um, so it's an amazing project. I also uh, really am a fan of Amelia Watten Wattenberger's blog. She does these really kind of in-depth interactive blog posts. She has one on the CSS Cascade, which is impossible to over-recommend. Um, yeah. No, I, I co-signed. Super, super <laughs> cool. Um, very good. That's Josh Camo. Go to, we didn't really, all of your stuff will be in the, in the descriptions. Where can they find you online? Yeah, I, I try to make it easy. Um, so my Twitter is Josh W. Como. My last name is spelled C-O-M-E-A-U, which I recognize is strange, ends in three vowels and is pronounced like none of them, right? E-A-U and pronounces O. Um, uh, so joshwcomo.com is my blog. Um, and you can learn more about my CSS course at css4js.dev. And it's spelled with the dashes like CSS in JS. So css-for-js.dev. Awesome. Go there. I take the course. Thanks again. See Thank you. Later. you.